Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are Irenicast. I am Jeff. And this is Rajiv. And on the first and third Tuesday of every month, we bring to you our perspectives on theology and culture from a post-evangelical lens. Thank you for joining us for another conversation to provoke your progressive Christian imagination. And what a conversation we have for you this week. Uh, this week, Alan, Bonnie, and Casey are all on assignment, and Rajiv and I got the pleasure to sit down with uh, Dr. Larisha Hawkins and Linda Midget of the brand new documentary that's coming out called Same God. Rajiv, give us some context on what this, this uh, documentary is all about. So Same God is a fantastic documentary. Check it out. Website's in the show notes. But um, essentially, Dr. Hawkins is the first tenured African-American woman at Wheaton College. She wore a hijab in solidarity with Muslim women in the aftermath of the San Bernardino shootings that was done by some religious extremists. And it created a firestorm at Wheaton College, and she was let go. And as a tenured professor, uh, that's kind of a big deal. So the documentary is phenomenal. It's emotional. Uh, and it'll fire you up. It, it, it also places that situation firmly in the context of our political climate of the day. Right. The, the events of the documentary happened on the, the threshold of Trump and the White House and everything that's happened since then. And wow, what a conversation. Like literally Rajiv and I just finished uh, talking to both of them and we were so uh, blown away by the answers we were given and the context we were given yes. for everything they were doing. So, you know, w without any further ado, we want to get right into this. This will be a longer episode than usual. We were just having a conversation. This seems like something we don't want to cut down at all or, <laughs> or very little just to make it as clear as possible, everything that's being said in this conversation. So we hope you enjoy all of the information that you're going to hear about, about the film, about how you can follow our guests this week is going to be at the, on the, in the show notes, as usual, at arenacast.com slash 162. And of course, if you like what you hear and you want to continue to hear more of what we do at Irenicast, you can always help support the show by going to irenicast.com slash PayPal or irenicast.com slash support. So again, without any further ado, here is our conversation with Dr. Larisha Hawkins and Linda Midget. Um, yeah. So, uh, so in, in regard to kind of the film, I, I wanted to start out by asking Linda, you specifically, what drew you to this project? Uh, what, what made you want to tell this story in this way? And, and how is that connected to maybe your faith background and maybe some of the things that were motivating factors for you personally? Um, yeah, well, I am actually an alumna of Wheaton college. So when this story broke, it was December 2015 when I first saw the news blurb that said a professor at Wheaton College was wearing a hijab in solidarity with women. And, and I looked at it and I thought, that's interesting. And I forgot about it. I, I was intrigued just because of the Wheaton connection. And then a couple of days later, I realized that all hell had broken loose because of this. And as the story progressed and the controversy progressed, what really was fascinating to me was the polarization that was taking place amongst evangelicals. And it's a polarization that we live with now, so it's very commonplace. But in December 2015, it was really striking. And so initially, I was like, wow, this is really fascinating. All of the al alumni from the school are totally divided on this, right? So some of us feel like, okay, you know, this sort of is a Jesus-y thing she's trying to do that seems clear. And, you know, other alumni are like, oh, this is so terrible. She's a heretic and needs to be removed from the school. And I honestly was baffled as to why it was so extreme, why the reactions were so extreme. And that's really what I wanted to explore. I mean, it was more the rift between evangelicals as opposed to um, any perceived rift between Muslims and Christians. The question, of course, the big controversy of whether Muslims and Christians worship the same God 
is interesting to me, but I really directed the film more to answer the question of whether evangelicals worship the same God. Hmm. Ooh, yeah, interesting. So the title is a little tongue in cheek. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's really good. Um, sticking with the the filmmaking aspect for for another minute or so, one of the things that was interesting to me reviewing some background on how everything came together, and there's a number of people involved with making this film, and you know, as anything with life, you you have to choose partners to do something. But like, how did you go through the process of deciding and choosing who your partners were going to be? That's an interesting question. Yeah, I am not that person who can buy their way into anything that they want. So, <laughs> um, so that wasn't an option. And actually, you know, when you're an independent filmmaker, the biggest challenge is always financial. Always. I mean, I've I've been a television producer for several decades, and I've produced other documentaries. This is my first independent film. And so the finances have always been the the biggest challenge. And I really didn't know going into it how I was going to proceed, but it was a very deep, I don't know, it's almost a compulsion, I guess is the word. Like I felt like I had to do this. To even do the first interview with Larisha, I had to have funding for it because I didn't have it. My first partner was David Vanderveen, who also, he is, well, he's not really a graduate of Wheaton. He's a friend of mine from Wheaton. He ended up graduating from Calvin College in Grand Rapids. But I knew immediately when I, it hit me, like, this needs to be a documentary. The next thought was, who can, who can give me a little bit of seed money just to get, get going? And I figured David would understand sort of philosophically what I was trying to do. So he was the first person that I called and he was excited about it and said, yeah, you know, I'll give you enough money to get rolling. And then he brought in another executive producer, Kathy Treat, who is also a graduate of Wheaton. And that's how we got moving. So they gave me enough seed money just to do the first couple of interviews so that I could. Um, it, it was very important to me to be filming while it was happening. And for this not to be just a retrospective type of story, but to be getting it in real time. And so when, so, when in the process did you jump in? Like where you said you heard about the news story in December of 2015. When, when did you jump in in terms of like starting filming? When were you documenting the process? How long after that? Yeah, I started filming with Arisha in January. And so the whole controversy oh, wow. lasted for about two months total. I think it was 60 days, actually. And I was somewhere right in the middle of that. You know, we, we laugh about this because we have a little funny story. But um, the first interview I did with Larisha was in Houston. And she was there because she had a family member who was getting treatment for cancer. And I had not even, I had never talked to Larisha directly because she was in such a firestorm. She couldn't answer her own email, but I had gone through a friend of hers who was checking her email. And so the friend had vetted me and said to Larisha, I think you should do this. And so the first interview I did with Larisha, we had never even had a conversation. Um, and I would not have done the documentary without her participation. I mean, that was, there was no point in doing that, but Driving to Houston from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where I live now, there was a funny moment where I thought, okay, what if I get there and she's crazy? You know, because I haven't talked to her. Like, I had no way to know what was, you know, and I'm like, oh. But, you know, of course, that's not what happened. I met her and realized that she's lovely in many ways and was kind of relieved also to find out, like, okay, this is kind of what the story that I think it's going to be. Right. And Larisha, how, how was that for you? I, I can't imagine being in the fire store, the middle of all that media and everything on top of that, agreeing to be filmed even more like what for you, uh, you know, catapulted you in the decision to be like, no, no, I, I, I want to, I want to do this. It's hard to remember what was going through my mind at that moment relative to the film. I just knew I trusted my girlfriend and that she thought you know, what have you got to lose? I didn't know how filmmaking worked. I thought, you know, I, I didn't know what it was going to become, you know, I didn't know that it would become like pretty much for the next, what, two and a half years that we would be filming together. I just had no clue. 
I did. I didn't either. To be fair, Theresha. <laughs> <So, laughs> you know. Well, because we because we've talked about this so much together, um, Linda also often says she didn't know if she would get there, and I was figure out that I was crazy, and that's why I was being fired. <laughs> like they wanted to fire me, you know. <laughs> or, um, and she said, "Well, as a filmmaker, we would. I would have made that work, you know." she's crazy and that's what happened, but it opens up this other possibility. So it's, it's funny because I could tell the story for her and she could <laughs> tell the story for me. Um, but relative to what was going through my mind at that moment, it was just like, well, everything's already crazy, you know? And my friend Ruth, who was checking my email, she's one of my best friends from, from college. And I went to college in Houston as well. We actually filmed at my friend's house who said, I vetted this woman. I watched her documentaries. I checked out, you know, she's won Emmy Awards and all of this stuff. And I remembered actually that um, one of Linda's documentaries had been, or maybe both of them had been screened at Wheaton College while I was there. And that I was unable to attend because it's like one of those days where there's a million things happening on a college campus. So I was like, sure, you know, I can interview with the lady. It's not like signing my life away or something. And so that's, you know, I just kind of trusted my friend Ruth and I was like, oh, whatever. I didn't think it was going to be like the Kardashian show or something or whatever they call that. <laughs> keeping up with the, keeping up uh, with the Larisha, you know. Um, <laughs> so, and we didn't know, I mean, I didn't know how long it was going to drag on, right? Like Linda said, I was there because my mom had, you know, cancer. Um, she was being treated at MD Anderson. Um, so in the middle of that, I was like, yeah, I'm going to keep going. You know, my sister and I, or my dad, one of us would always accompany her. And this was a very big appointment for her. And so I was in Houston and um, I also spoke at my alma mater, um, Rice University, which is right there in Texas, and then met with Linda. So this was all one trip where this wow. happened. Um, but I think our first interview, Linda says, was four hours. Maybe. It was. And we still didn't make it through everything. We ran out of time. Because you had to go somewhere for some other engagement, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think yeah. a, a, a thank you to Ruth is deserved, yeah. <laughs> right? Is, you know, the the documentary is is powerful, and uh, we haven't said it yet, but we'll say it several times to our listeners: watch this documentary, find a way to see it. Same God, absolutely. Um, one of the central pieces of of the documentary is this idea of embodied solidarity. Um, where did that come from? So um, I was a professor at, for your listeners who don't know, I was a professor at Wheaton College. Um, it was my first academic job after graduate school. And Wheaton College is a Christian university. It's interdenominational and we have students ranging from Seventh-day Adventists to Assemblies of God to Catholic to Baptist, like I grew up, to Presbyterian, to Episcopal. And I'm, I'm being, um, you know, I'm casting this vision because there's a lot of theological diversity at Wheaton College. What kind of unites people at Wheaton is they understand that the flavor of this Christian university is evangelical. And the way that I appropriate that term as a scholar is different than the way I think people think about evangelical as individuals who wear that term is different than the way that evangelicals are thought of in society and politics. And so I'm at an institution essentially that is considered the flagship evangelical institution academically, the Harvard of Christian colleges, it's often called. And so it's this very um, brilliant students, wonderful students, brilliant colleagues. And in the midst of that, teaching students who keep me accountable for what I'm talking about, both from a spiritual perspective, but also from a theoretical perspective. As a political science professor, I can't tell my students to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God in the universe unless I'm willing to do that. And at least I can't, I can't embody that contradiction. And so I just started to be honest with my students about the fact that, you know, when you're going for the Holy Grail in academia, which is tenure, you have to do a lot of sitting on your butt in the library, publishing, 
at a school like Wheaton, teaching, mentoring, doing community service. And what that means is you're not out there doing justice, loving mercy, walking humbly. Now, my calling to be a professor is important, but those other callings are equally important from my vantage point. So I started um, kind of professionally, pedagogically, personally thinking, what does it look like to have my students begin to live out? I first called it like being an embodied question mark, like speaking truth to power like the prophets would. Um, that's kind of how it started. Um, Isaiah, like the prophets, especially Isaiah chapter one, became very central to my thinking about what does it mean to be a Christian in a world where always in evangelicalism, your individual righteousness is emphasized, but not the justice part. And these aren't separate tracks. What the prophets make clear is these are inseparable. These aren't parallel things. They're actually wedded. Um, you can't say you're righteous if you're not doing justice. If righteous folks supposedly live in a city and the city is not rejoicing, meaning um, prospering in their bodily welfare, material welfare, then something's off, right? Um, then the righteous folk aren't taking care of their own and they're not taking care of the other. So I just began thinking like, what does it look like as a professor at an institution with resources? I'm sending kids out to write, to help rewrite the Macedonian constitution. Literally a former student went to Harvard and as a law student was helping rewrite a constitution of a country. What does it look like to embody justice? So it started off as, you know, let your presence be the thing that calls institutions to bear. And then it was like, well, actually, that's still kind of stuck up in the head and like integrating body and spirit. I mean, I used to always tell my students, we're not just this. Um, you're not just minds. We're not just developing your mind. We're developing your whole person here. I know this is a long answer, but I'm a professor. What am I going to do? So, um, so essentially it just became like, how do we get out of the classroom and into the world? Period. So how do we embody solidarity, not just talk about it? And so I started saying theoretical solidarity isn't solidarity. Talking about justice and theory in the classroom is one thing, but how are we going to actual, actualize that and activate that in the world? And so I started a peace and conflict studies program at Wheaton. You know, wrote the went to a conference at Notre Dame. God bless the Catholics, the mothership, and then um, came back with the knowledge from Notre Dame and wrote curriculum. Got it passed, and I was literally in the first semester of teaching. I was in the intro to peace and conflict studies class when I got the text from my department chair saying, "Are you going to this meeting?" I had this. I had the scarf on my head. Right. Um, I'm in my final class. It's the final exam. They're giving presentations. And I had my phone out because I was taking their pictures and I get the text. And I know, I just know, like, this is the beginning of the end. It's the beginning of the end. You know, like I say, I didn't know that for sure, but I thought all hell's about to break loose. Um, but that's how Embodied Solidarity started. The, those that were, that phrase came together in that class, in that classroom at Wheaton College. Um, but I had been thinking about it for years. So it's kind of this build up to what does it look like for me to be teaching people who are supposed to embody Jesus, right? So I start calling it embodied solidarity because that's what I think the Sermon on the Mount Jesus did. So. Hmm. And Larisha, for you, where's I, I'm curious, where's um, if you got feedback or if you feel like there's there's a line or a connection or I don't know, to use a term that's overused, a slippery slope between a, a cultural embodiment, which I think, you know, I'm, I'm in solidarity with this group and, and cultural appropriation where you're, you're, you're taking one of their symbols and, you know, making sure. it your own. Uh, how, how did you maneuver through that aspect of, you mean of the, me wearing the hijab specifically? Yes, correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Um, so the very, it was December 10th, 2015, and I'm, I'm sticking to the date, the timeline, just because it's important. December 10th was the last week of classes at Wheaton College. And a student approached me about wearing the hijab home on an airplane. And I told her, I said, you know, this is a great idea because this was right after San Bernardino. 
you know, the shootings had happened in San Bernardino. You guys are in California. I know you remember it better than a lot of people in the U.S. Because we forget there are so many. That's a different topic. Gun violence, right? Right. Um, Mm -hmm. But that gun violence happened to be um, initiated by a Muslim extremist, right? We've got Christian extremists. But this was a Muslim extremist and his partner, presumably. And so in the wake of that, if if you and your listeners recall, there was a lot of anti-Muslim vitriol. And so my student's idea, she was in my um, senior seminar at the time, and we were talking about these themes in my senior seminar um, called The Christian Life and Politics, right? So how do we translate this political thing into living out our, our lives as Christians in the world? So we're talking about the same concepts in my senior seminar. And she said, I would like to wear the hijab on the airplane home and have college students do it and have it this be this event, right? Because that's how right. millennials think. These one-shot things, <laughs> put it on social media, all her college friends across the country would do it. And I thought, this is a great idea, but we need to talk to our Muslim brothers and sisters about, would this be considered haram, unclean? Is this defiling of the concept of hijab? And I called some friends of mine. And I had a relationship with several Muslims. Um, what I realized in retrospect, all my Muslim friends were men at the time, friends from graduate school. Um, I served on a board. Um, so I was very active and engaged in the labor community in Chicago. And I was on the board of a group called the Rai Chicago. So I had two Muslim colleagues on the board. I called the Council on American Islamic Relations. And to ask them, what do you think? My student wants to do this. She wants to do this as an act of Christian devotion um, in solidarity with her Muslim sisters. Well, as college students are, I called CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. They said, let us talk to the board. And since my friend was a man, he's like, let me talk to the women on the board and see what they think. He called back. He said, we think this is a wonderful idea. In fact, Larisha, we want to make this educational. Have your students keep a journal. And then we'll have a panel after Christmas or after the holidays um, and the winter holidays and have a Muslim woman who wears a hijab, a Muslim woman who doesn't, your college students who do. And I told him, I'm going to participate, right? So this was, we had a plan. Literally the night before I did the Facebook post or maybe that morning, I emailed and I said, you know, I want to err on the side of caution. I, I think that maybe we won't do it. And they were like, no, we called our friends at CBS News to tell them we have these friends who are supporting us and um, and we want them to do a story. So that's the night that I posted. I didn't hear from my student. She was busy doing college student things the last week of school, but I did my Facebook post. And so it was a Facebook post that initiated some of the controversy. That's where I said Muslims and Christians and Jews, but I didn't put that in the Facebook post because I was talking about my Muslim neighbor And I talked about embodied solidarity, and that's why I was wearing the hijab. So I'm answering your question by saying the Muslim community wasn't asking about cultural appropriation. People outside the Muslim community have asked about cultural appropriation. And in fact, when I got to class, since it was the last week of school, I had my final class that Friday. It was a Thursday that I made the Facebook post. That Friday, a student in my class who is of Syrian descent, her mom is is Syrian said, how is this not cultural appropriation? And we had a conversation, the last day of peace and conflict studies, regular semester class. And we talked about the fact, um, some of it's about intent. Some of it is, is this meant to be, for some people, fashion? Hijab is not fashion, right? Right. Hijab is a concept that is utilized, means honor God with your body. And some interpret, it's not in the Quran. And some People interpret the hijab as for all Muslims, whether they put a scarf on their head literally or not or whatever. There are many forms of hijab, too, um, forms of covering um, one's head in various cultures uh, or covering one's body. And um, in fact, men wear a hijab is, is the way one of my friends in the Muslim community talks about it, because it's all about honoring God with our body. And I said, oh, well, in the Christian community, we talk about putting on the armor of God um, and that our bodies are a temple. And so the concept is similar for a Christian. And also Mary, the mother of God, wore a hijab, right? And so um, the only way that I would have done it and my student would have done it is with the blessing of 
the Muslim community. Clearly, we didn't pull every Muslim. Right, um, for sure. <laughs> but the response I still get today is, you did this out of support and like embodied solidarity with us. And then they usually say, and you lost your job. I mean, Linda and I were just in Chicago and a woman comes up to me and that's what she said to her little girl. This lady lost her job for us. Right. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's super helpful uh, context. Like I think that partnership being a central focus of that. And then that last point that you made being huge in the sense that you lost as a result, as opposed to gain Mm -hmm. something, which tends to be a, uh, I mean, I will say that as somebody who's sort of walked alongside Larisha now for four years, one of the things that I've learned about embodied solidarity by observation and by being part of this process is that it's it's really taking the somebody else's burden. And that's the exact opposite to me, in my mind, from cultural appro- appropriation. There, there were no rewards for what Larisha did. Um, there was condemnation. There had been tremendous sacrifices. And so the burden of vitriol that the that Muslim women were experiencing then and continue to experience now, Larisha shared with them. And I I to me, I mean I we show the film a lot of Muslim communities and there is a tremendous sense of gratefulness for that because the the loving intent behind it I think is very clear to them. That's a difference. Yeah. And I think it's a great question. I wanted to err on the side of over explaining in part because I never want to be seen as shutting down that question. Um, even because the outcome in the, amongst the Muslim community is generally positive. That doesn't, I'm not saying that makes it okay. Right. Right. Um, And what I'm saying is when people, I do want to say to liberals, progressives, people left of center, whatever you call oneself, I think, and this goes back to the whole issue of, me wearing the hijab of um, the moment that we're in the polarized moment that we're in where families don't eat Thanksgiving dinner together anymore. Part of it is there's a rush to judgment on all sides. There's not just two sides and cultural appropriation is something that people throw down like a gauntlet or a bomb to sometimes end conversation. And again, I'm not saying that's what you were doing. It's a very appropriate question. But I think it's a something on the left that people trot out as a way of defending people who don't need defending. Muslim women are some of the strongest women I've ever met in my life, right? And I think that a lesson for me as someone who would be considered by the world very left of center or very left of center, depending on who you are and where you sit, right? <laughs> right. Um, because it's all relative is that um, when I was at Wheaton, people were beginning, had begun kind of almost when I got to Wheaton in 2007 to talk about social justice warriors and um, people who only want to interpret the justice part of the Bible. And it has to be read in its totality. The reason I love the Isaiah passage is it speaks to both. It's righteousness and justice, right? And that In the midst of one of the problems of Christianity, not just evangelical Christianity, is the camps are the righteous on the one side, the ones who want to do the the righteousness lovers, the justice lovers, and we can't separate them. If we're Jesus people, it's both and all the time, simultaneously, works with grace, um, faith without works. These go together. And so I love the cultural appropriation question because I think it chastises all of us in a good way to think about the fact that the outward works, yes, can just be works, but we have to look, we do have to look at the heart and the intent behind it and the context in which it's happening. And I think that it's the context that is easy to lose, that what was happening at the time was really grievous and serious. And in the context of the moment, it really meant a lot. And Muslims, more than most groups, get the context of what was happening then and what's happening now is even worse, right? 
But to your point, I'm very careful now about there's World Hijab Day just passed on February the 1st. It's important for me now to be invited in. And a point that I wanted to make is if we were in, if we went to a mosque, it would behoove women to bring a scarf and put it on their head out of deference and respect. If I go to a Japanese tea room, I take off my shoes. If I go to a majority Muslim country, women should probably bring a scarf and put it on their head because that's appropriate in context. All of my Christian missionary friends call God Allah and wear the hijab when they live in Tunisia or Morocco or wherever they're missionaries, right? And so context really matters for these questions. And the context of the time is like some shit was going down and I wasn't going to let it happen without being in solidarity. So it's funny because my student did not show up with a hijab on her head the next day at school. One or two colleagues did and one or two students did. And one student um, was the recipient of violence on campus at Wheaton uh, College as a result. So, yeah. Well, that that response is has so many wonderful layers to it. And I really appreciate you giving, you know, honoring us with a, a, a thorough overview of your thought process you mean like being too talkative the no 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 <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm a That's former a educator too, for and <laughs> i'm a former preacher so you got me you, um, got me. <laughs> you know it's like because it's it's rare when you're a public figure it's rare that you get your side really explained and and the thought processes and so this this in some ways is a longer form opportunity to to do that but embedded in your response well let me, let me say this a lot of times we will ask as folks in work like this we will ask this question of white folks and oftentimes there isn't an answer hmm. and what i'd like to lift up is your answer is almost a mini handbook on how to do this on how to do embodied solidarity with a group that isn't your own. If anybody's thinking about what solidarity looks like and you're not part of the group you're trying to stand up for, your answer is a fantastic model that that folks can adopt. So I, thank I thank you, you for that. Um, I, I want to jump backwards a little bit to, to Wheaton College. You, you talked about the theological diversity and so on, and I'm very much an outsider when it comes to Wheaton. Um, did you go to a Christian school? I did. Okay. <laughs> I did go to uh, a Seventh-day Adventist college, and I did my, my graduate studies at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. So, you know, the largest consortia seminaries in the world, very liberal progressive. So, you know, universe is away. But one of the things that I immediately look at when I, when I look at Christian institutions like Wheaton, like where I went to undergrad, is is this, in essence, a white supremacist organization that uses Christian theology and dogma to propagate white supremacy? And from a distance, I'm thinking, you know, and then there's the claims, well, like where I went to school was very racially diverse, but it was white supremacist. It's like, we're, you know, the white way is the right way. And then there's this religious stuff that you do, too. In your experience, and, and as I was learning about Wheaton through your experience and then trying to find out on my own, I was like, holy smokes, this place looks to me like a flagship of, of that model, where it is really a white supremacist institution that uses the Christian message and sort of the veneer of plurality to propagate that idea. So a am I totally wrong? Is there some truth to that observation? So, yes. And I say yes, because I think Wheaton, your college, University of Virginia, where I teach now, all of these are white supremacist institutions. They can't not be unless the, they decide to be intentionally anti-racist. And most institutions in this country have not decided mm -hmm. that they're down for that. Because to do so would be to dissociate from the meritocracy, and all those things that keep these institutions going, or so they think, right? Money is the mother's milk of the United States. It's capitalism, period. And so 
these institutions can't not be white supremacist institutions. That's not a way of not answering your question more personally. I can talk all day about the ways that Wheaton College is unaware of the ways that it's white supremacist. What I will also tell you honestly from the bottom of my heart is I know that my provost hired me because he was determined to increase the diversity of Wheaton College because he believed it would make Wheaton better. I know he believed that, but what white supremacist institutions don't know and the people who work in them, however kind and good hearted they are about not using diversity as a token, it becomes a token when you get the people there and you don't know how to deal with them. You don't, you don't build the structures, you don't change the structures or build new structures to keep them. So you have something called faculty retention. How many of these faculty of color and women that you bring in are staying? How many of them are getting tenure? How's their health faring? Did you develop high blood pressure when working at that institution? Yeah. Did you begin taking a little white pill every day so you could check your damn email? Yeah. So the reality is the white power structure, I don't believe is gonna change from within unless they do the thing that you just said I did, which I, I've never framed it in the way you did. Thank you for calling it a hand of like a playbook. I'm like, I like you. You can follow me around everywhere I go and tell me like how I need to frame stuff. I wrote a, I wrote the handbook on how, no, I'm saying that because it was helpful for me to hear that the thing that I, the thing that I began doing is saying, I came there in part because I'm an educator. I came there in large part because I'm a Christian, I'm a political scientist who happens to be a Christian who studies the intersection of religion, race, ethnicity, and politics, which means I also study gender and sexuality. And so I'm a lightning rod everywhere I go. I didn't grow up calling myself a lightning rod. And then I guess I got to Wheaton and I became the blackest black woman there ever was. And I became a lightning rod and everywhere I went, I was causing controversy. Um, and that's fine because that's what I, I was there as a woman who was raised in a black church in the, the, the spirit of the prophetic voice and the black Moses um, and black Jesus explicitly or implicitly, because we had a picture of white Jesus in my church, just so you know, because like we all internalize white supremacy and colonialism. Um, and so I was there to unroot it from myself and my students and the institution and white supremacist institutions don't like that. Mm -hmm. Prophets get killed in this country. Mm -hmm. Everywhere. Yep. And that's the nature of the prophet. And I'm not calling myself a prophet. I'm talking about the prophetic voice. People want to root it out and silence it. That's how white supremacist institutions work. So we just didn't know what it was getting. They thought they were getting a black girl who got evangelicalism because I was in Campus Crusade in college. But I didn't call myself an evangelical. And by the way, all Christians are supposed to be evangelical. Because that's what the Bible says. You're supposed to share the good news. Um, but it's it's a thing. It's a difficult thing um, for people to be confronted with their own racism. So I finally said, stop telling me to tell you how to be racist because you don't want to know. America don't want to know. Wheaton don't want to know because America don't want to know. And that's what's happening in our country right now. People are being confronted with their racism. So all of a sudden, white people got politics. Right. Right. And that's what's happening. That's right. That's my short explanation. <laughs> Identity politics is all the rage because now white people figured out they white and they got something to protect. And I, I wanted to ask you about that, actually, uh, identity politics as it's related to embodied solidarity. How do you link or delink the two notions? Um, I think identity politics is American politics. Interest group politics is identity politics. The wonderful thing about this country is at any given time around any issue or problem, we can form groups. We can lobby at multiple levels of government. That's beautiful. But all of a sudden when black and brown, indigenous, women, gay, queer, 
trans people do it, it's identity politics. Oh, but then when the white majority realizes it's going down, that they might not, but by the way, they'll be in economic power for a long damn time. But all of a sudden, a black man is elected and there's a threat. And and now white identity politics are okay and they're embracing it. Believe me, it's being embraced. And so identity politics has always been, and it's only critiqued when the most oppressed, when the sleeping giant, right, wakes up. It's very Marxian, right? It's it's all of a sudden when those who are powerless move into their power that the power structure suppresses it. That's what's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and now it's called identity politics by people on the left, the progressive left and the right. It's the genteel moderate right, the people who like the blacks and stuff, the neocons, the crunchy cons, you know, the environmental conservatives, they're the ones condemning identity politics. It's not Breitbart. It's not Steve Bannon. They're pro-identity politics. And you know who on the left is condemning identity politics? The elite um, folks in the academy that I'm in, whose parents were PhDs or art dealers or whatever. It's the money left. They're not too wealthy. They're not the wealthy class, but they're the comfortable six-figure class. They're in the top 10%. And the reality is, yes, it's economic, but it's also racial. And so I'm I'm a critiquer of the left and the right, and you don't have to like me. I don't care. I call it as I see it. But that's the reality. Um, embodied solidarity is not about identity politics because everyone needs embodied solidarity at some point. But the Jesus I know saw the least and the last and the left out. And so moving to those places of marginalization and oppression in general, it it tends to take me towards the economically oppressed, which tend to map onto people of color, the environmentally oppressed. And there are white folks in that group, um, in both of those groups, and just those people that we refuse to see, those that we keep pushing down. And so my prayer about embodied solidarity is that God would give me the eyes to see the oppressed, whoever they are and wherever they are. So there's no sifting line. I'm, this isn't like anti-white. If I'm anti-racist, then it's not about excluding the powerful. The powerful need solidarity. They have a form of poverty. It's about yeah. going to the poor. Yeah. That was the thing that 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 struck me about coming into the documentary was thinking this is going to be more of a theological issue, but I think that the framework, it really became in a lot of ways an issue uh, about race within those theological frameworks Mm -hmm. and um, kind of, you know, as, uh, and, and Linda for you as, as a filmmaker, as someone whose, whose language is, is visual. uh, One of the things that struck me in the very beginning of the, the documentary was the juxtaposition of, talking about Wheaton as this first stop on the, the underground railroad accompanied by images of pristine Southern style buildings and pillars. And then the juxtaposition with, uh, Larisha sitting in a Mexican food restaurant with other people of color and, and seeing the difference between what it looks like to say something and not have it match. And the difference between just living in it and not having to say a word about it. And I really, I really appreciated how that set the tone. So after you're kind of in the midst of this, this, this firestorm of everything that's happening and you're filming and you're documenting and all that kind of stuff, when you sit down to do the editing process and then start to craft the story visually, what were some of the things that, that really informed the the way that you, you put that together? Yeah, well, one of the things that's things that's interesting about being a filmmaker is that um, every story, every project, every film kind of has a life of its own. So it's interesting to me even hearing your analysis of it because honestly, some of those things are just subconscious. Like I don't, I can, you know, I would like to say, oh, we really thought that out, but sometimes it's it's not something that you are necessarily even aware that you are doing. There are visual themes that emerge as we're filming. And some of them I'm very aware of. Some of them I'm not aware of until we sit down and start the edit. 
I wish my editor were on this call because she could, you know, this is, I can't take credit for the beautiful job that she did editing and um, that part of the storytelling. Um, Leslie Pupasal is my editor. I just think she was brilliant at doing. I don't know. The, the, the film has, it, it has a life of its own. I, it's funny. We, we realized at some point, wow, we have all of this footage of Larisha putting on makeup and, so Risha is always like getting in the car. She puts her makeup on in the car. And you know, I learned these things about her, right? I observed her for two and a half years. <laughs> um, part of that is that's just life. That's what we happen to be capturing. But when you go and put it in a film, it somehow becomes emblematic of, of Larisha and this you know, outward face that she has to the public. The idea of her being perceived one way and not understood, like not seen for who she is. Like there are all of these levels of meaning that happen visually that are very deep and subconscious. And all I can tell you as a filmmaker, at some point, my editor and I were like, yeah, we like this theme of her putting on makeup. And I knew it was important. There's a scene in the film where her makeup mirror has cracked and she makes a little joke about it, but she's the, the cameraman says to her, and you hear the audio in the film, he says, is that cracked? And she said, yeah, it's, it's broken. And she said, it's a metaphor. And it's funny because I've, as many times as the film has been screened, sometimes the audience laughs at that, but they laugh because it's true. It's not funny. It's true. She is, she is cracked. She is broken. <laughs> Um, and so it pulls in all of that, that footage. And I, I'm not, I, I feel in our or I in, It's funny. I interpret it another way. How do I you interpret it? This is so funny. We have never talked about this scene. Y'all got this out of us. Good job, Arinica. <laughs> um, I interpret it as bad luck. Mm. Oh, I had dropped, yeah, the, I had dropped the mirror. I think it was in an airport or a bathroom. And it's just one of these big, like, I mean, you saw the film, but if you don't remember, I'm putting, I'm actually inside putting on makeup, not in my car. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but it was one of those big things with um, eyeshadow in it. And it had the huge mirror because it got too many eyeshadows that you never use. And so um, that's how they get you to buy it. You think you're going to use it, you never do. So you use the same three little things and they're almost all out. But then I dropped it and so the mirror cracked. And a cracked mirror, it's bad luck, isn't it? Right. Seven years of bad luck right. or something. Um, and so in my mind, I was saying it's a metaphor for my life, like bad luck, you know, anyway. And it's funny, but it can be read in many ways, which is what art does. Right. It allows people right. to read into it, whatever. It, it does. And it's, it, it is, it's, it, it's fascinating. It's, it's mm -hmm. really fascinating. Some of the things I'm very aware of, some of the things when I, when we're filming, I know I can feel it. I don't even know how to explain it. I can. I will tell you one of the most exciting shoots for me is um, was when I filmed Larisha with you and Michael Mangus at the church that you guys attended. You know, I felt like the spirit of God, not just because it was a church, but I felt that with me as a filmmaker. It was like, oh, this is really important. And that footage has been really important to me because it, it comes at the end of the film and it happens to be a church where there are people of, of every color, you know, um, they're LGBTQ, everybody's welcome. And there's this little moment in the footage where there's a little white baby that gets communion. And then right after that, it's a little black baby that gets communion. And they're, it's beautiful to me. And I've, you know, sometimes... Sometimes see, people, I never thought about that either because it's my oh, yeah, and, and, and see, they, they bless the baby or if the parent lets them, they, they, they give the baby a little cracker or a piece of bread. So some parents let the baby get the bread and some people probably grew up Baptist and they're like, no, you can bless the baby, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and or Seventh-day Adventist. Or but like to me, that scene is important because I feel like it's a picture of what the world is supposed to look like, mm -hmm. right? That yeah. everybody's there and loving. And that's, you know, that's a very obvious way to read it, but it's, I, I, it, I actually fought to keep that scene in the film, even though I've, you know, the, the initial cut of the film was two hours and 20 minutes. And I was like, oh, I bet we can trim 10 minutes out of this. So I trimmed and I trimmed and I cut it down to 95 minutes. 
so I cut about, you know, 40 minutes of the film out because I just had to be really ruthless in what are the most important parts of the story that I fought to keep that scene in because it's really important to me, you know? The so- Eucharist is important to me um, as emblematic of the leveling that Jesus does, right? Because embodied solidarity is about radical, it's about radical equality, but it's also about preference, a preferential option for the poor because Catholic social teaching has really effect, affected my teaching at Wheaton. Um, we always talked about Catholic social teaching and a seamless garment, a consistent ethic of life. So for me, that's another thing that informs my views of embodied solidarity. The idea that if all of this stuff is true, the Jesus movement, what it means to me, it's radical liberation of all people materially as well as spiritually, but then also radical leveling. And the table, the Eucharistic table in an Episcopal church, all are welcome at the table. All are welcome. And to me, that is the message of Jesus. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, in this table, you can eat and drink and be fed and be satisfied. It's it's the opposite of material consumption in the U.S. It really is um, being consumed by the body of Christ, not consuming. It's when I step into that, I am being consumed by the reality, a different reality, a different kingdom. And to me, that's the picture. Um, embodied solidarity is moving into that radical reality of equality, period. So the Eucharist, that's what the Eucharist means to me. And for me in the film, it's my church. So it's hard for me to look at my church and not just see what I love about my church. And to me, like the babies going up and getting blessed or taking, or getting a little bit of communion bread, it's just part of it. But to me, that is the loveliest part of the service because that reality grips me. When I'm like, do I believe this stuff? It's the Eucharist. That's the only thing that keeps me going. That's the only vision. That's the only vision. Because 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 God's people don't act like God's people. And the only thing that reminds me that I want to be a part of that is that vision. Period. Yeah, I can I can relate to that pretty deeply. It's like for that one moment, we're together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and we're and even in that moment, I've been giving communion and some, and I said, the body of Christ, and a guy said, metaphorically. We can't even be together in that moment, friend. I wish. <laughs> I wish. But, you know, Larisha, this is what I was going to say, that, and not to go down a rabbit hole, but, you know, I grew up in a tradition where, um, I mean, first of all, it wasn't called the Eucharist. It was the Lord's Supper. Me too. Supper. I know. Yeah, the you know, Lord, but, Lord's Supper. But it was also My very, papa is rolling in his grave. Yeah, I have spent many years in churches where it's always explicitly said, you know, don't come to the table if you have unconfessed sin. And this is only for Christians, only if you believe. Like there's a very strong message of don't come to the table kind of if you aren't worthy. And I've been to a church where you can't come to the table if you're not a certain kind of Lutheran. Yeah. It, you're, you can be Christian, but you can't come if you're not Missouri Synod Lutheran. It's just, it's, it's fascinating. It's such a long discussion. My, um, you know, I, I grew up in a very non-denominational evangelical background, but I've spent a lot of time in Presbyterian churches, but my children go to a Catholic school here in Southwest Louisiana. It, it always was kind of funny to me when they first started going to school there and they have mass every Friday. They can't take communion because they're not Catholic. And so they, they, they receive a blessing, right? So you cross your hands over your chest and you receive the blessing. <laughs> and my children came home from school and they said, mom, we can't take communion. We have to X ourselves out. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> they, they X themselves out by crossing their hands on their chest. Wow. But it says a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it does. I mean, if if you two want to come back, we can do a whole episode on just the Eucharist and then the whole <laughs> yeah, episode on just embodied I was solidarity. Just say, this is your show, not ours. Sorry. No, we this got is, off on the Eucharist. No, this is good. <laughs> no, that's that's deeply meaningful. Yeah, I've I've heard that whole 
Yeah, it's interesting. And I don't know what it is about me, my personality, but I've been in churches and been in settings where they'll say that from up front. I'm like, that, I'm going to walk up. And at this point, I've gotten the side eye from people, but the priest or whoever, the presider, is never quite sure if I'm like faking or real. But they they can see that I'm there to receive communion. So mm-hmm. at, to date, I haven't been denied yet, yeah. and and that's been interesting. I keep I keep thinking that'll happen, but I don't I don't visit that many churches anymore. Um, I'm pretty plugged into my local congregation, but uh, yeah, it's it's like I've never felt like that should be denied to anyone in any circumstance. And if people are saying it should be, I'm like, mm, no, I don't I don't think so. So, yeah, the the variance around that is pretty interesting. And the whole, well, it's metaphorical. Okay. <laughs> or it's, uh, don't bite it or it'll bleed. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I think that that, in the midst of all that, I think that's the, the, the beauty of using this medium to tell this story is that it, it, it leaves room for people to see a part of their tradition in it to, to, to create that connection and see, you know, this is, this is more than just a news story that I either read about or saw a clip on going past and formed this full opinion on, but now seeing it in a visual way and, and looking at all the different dynamics of it. Uh, I, I personally, I really, I'm drawn towards the, the medium of film and, um, I really appreciated the way that all this was put together and that how, uh, how the story was told in the midst of that. And, kind of going through that whole experience, the Risha, I'm curious, um, you know, a lot of times throughout the story that was told is that you would say, you know, I'll sign the statement of faith. I'll sign the statement of faith. I'm fine signing the statement of faith. And I, I wonder now after all this has happened and where you are now, how your own faith and theology evolved. And if you could still say that you would sign the statement of faith today. Um, this is a great question. No one's, I knew you were going to say that when you phrased it, <laughs> but no one's ever particularly asked me if I would sign it today. It has been a difficult journey. Um, I like to say it spiritually. I've really tried to avoid language of faith because, especially since this happened, I'm more aware of that. In part because I think there's a really facile way that evangelicals use this term faith. There's a facile way that evangelicals talk about the church when really they mean evangelical churches and certain kinds of evangelical churches in particular. Even in the film, someone refers to the church, a friend of mine refers to the church, Jean Green, um, whom I love. But I don't think he meant the Catholic Church. I don't think he meant the Holy Catholic Church, small c. And I used to tell my students at Wheaton, when you talk about the church, you mean evangelical. You mean Protestant. And I tried to, you know, get that out of them, disabuse them of using that phraseology. And in the same way, when people talk about faith these days, I don't know what they mean anymore. It's very personalized. And I think that for me, I I like to say that I'm on a spiritual journey. And this is also what I would tell my students that we, I want, I think that all of us want to be met where we are on our, if people want to call it their faith journey, on our spiritual journey. And I think faith is exclusive as a term in the way that it's used. All of my friends who are spiritual, some of them would never talk about faith, having faith. And so where I am on my own spiritual journey is trying to hang in and to maintain those, I like to call them liturgies of life. I think James Kars calls it um, everyday experiences. He's got a book about it. But it's, it's what are these everyday experiences that point me to the Jesus? So seeing Jesus in my Muslim friends. Um, when I was at Wheaton, I used to always visit students who were studying in developing countries. So I've mostly visited the poorest countries in the world. And if those were the only places I went, yay, because I learned so much about what it means to live Jesus 
live radical hospitality from the poorest people to people with the least to give, often give the most, not often, always give the most to strangers and friends alike. And so when I talk about my spiritual journey, I talk about the fact that it's been really hard since I left Wheaton to step into churches because these places that used to be my home, people may not know. In the film, we visit my childhood church here in Oklahoma. My grandfather was my pastor. I was baptized by my grandfather two days before he died in the church. And churches are formative to my earliest memories of who I am. And specifically the Black Church, Black Baptist Church that I grew up in. And now the church feels unsafe. It used to feel like a home. And now it feels like a place that it feels very hard to go into. And I'm not angry at God in the universe, but I'm honest with God about the fact that uh, it's really difficult right now to want to grapple with these questions. And so I just tell people, I told my pastor recently when he asked how I was doing, I said, you know, I'm in a space, I'm in this space where I don't know how I am and that has to be okay. Because part of what my spiritual journey has been has been reading theology, you know, taking a whole class on the Reformation so I could read the Reformers in the original, you know, um, as an undergrad. And I'm, I'm done with that. I'm done with reading about what it means to be a Jesus follower. And I'm living into what it means to be a Jesus follower the best way I know how, embodying solidarity, the way that I think Jesus did on the Sermon on the Mount. And so um, that's where I am. And yes, my mom is like, did you go to church today? Why did you, you know, Reverend Sheets is not your reverend. Um, all those jokes we have in the, in the Black Baptist Church, you know, whatever. Um, that's where I am. Not whatever. I mean, it's consequential. It feels really hard to talk about. But that's where I am on my spiritual journey. Is, um, everyone wants to be met where they are. And I want to be met where I am. And that's where I am. But I would never sign a faith, statement of faith again as a principle because I've decided their litmus test. In, in your voice, those of us that have been through cycles or, or periods where we've had to separate from the places of our formation and childhood, I can mm -hmm. hear pain and longing mm -hmm. in your voice um, that resonates with my own pains and my own longings. And we have a lot of listeners who are going through periods of transition as well. Um, could you just offer some words of personal advice and and maybe some coping strategies uh, uh, that you have found useful? Yeah. Um, I think the best thing that, well, the hardest thing for me was to be kind to myself. And I want to say, Actually, this difficulty of my spiritual journey started while I was still at Wheaton. When I say that the Eucharist is very meaningful to me, when I was at Wheaton, and all my friends know this, all my friends, close friends at Wheaton knew this while I was there, because people often have this thing. When you, when you work at the, you know, the, the flagship evangelical institution, it's evangelicalism on steroids. So, I had several friends who were like, if this is what it means to be a Christian, maybe I'm not a Christian, you know? There's a weird kind of air there. It's rarefied air. And in the evangelical ivory tower. And so I remember being like, if this is what it means to be a Christian, maybe I'm not one. And this is maybe two years in. And I was like, Larisha, do you believe this? Kind of like in the scripture when um, the guy says to himself, self, let's build bigger barns. And then his life is taken from him. I was like, self, do you believe this? And I was like, what's the craziest thing that the Jesus says? And it's like, unless you eat my body and drink my blood. And I was like, do you believe that? This is a conversation with myself in my head, in my body. And all I could say was, yes, that still has meaning to me. And it, it really did become a very literal meaning. Like it was the Eucharist that I longed for. It was that vision um even if it started as metaphorical vision it became for me a literal thing a living thing you know presbyterians like to say there's a special grace that you receive i'm like well whatever 
but there it's not magic, but the mystery that I think Protestants lack that um, many Catholics still preserve. Um, so that mysticism, the icons, like the bloody cross became meaningful to me. Like the idea of Jesus suffering, like suffering is what God's people do. They're God's people are wilderness people. They're stuck in the wilderness. They're stuck in the desert. They're eating locusts. They're burning up under a tree, you know, and this is who we're called to be. And we're caught up in this materialist culture so much so that we don't get that in my background um, as a black woman, my inheritance, my inheritance is of um, a spirituality that does not separate sacred and secular. That's an enlightenment thing. And um, it's not just an American thing. It's a post enlightenment thing. And that is not how I want to live my life. I want to live my life seeing, seeing with the eyes of Christ. If that's a real thing, everything is of sacred significance. And so that changed the way that I approached church. I ended up um, leaving the Presbyterian church I was going to and going to an Episcopal church because I wanted a view of the Eucharist where even though I had already embodied that view of the Eucharist as this beautiful table that comes alive, that actually my church didn't. And they would not allow someone who was gay to partake of the table, who was a member of our church, who wanted to help with children. And I was like, I can't stand to be in a church where someone is excluded from the table. Where if we want to be real, the college students next to me are hooking up. And if you want to fence the table, well, like, let's fence it equally. If you want to, like, have a conversation with everyone, not that I think being gay is a sin. That's not what I'm saying. But that pastor did. And that was it. I was like, deuces, I'm gone. And it was harder than that. It's very difficult for me to leave that church. But the reality is um, that saved my life, I think. That saved my life. And so I'm still committed to that vision, even though I don't know what all of that means. And I want people out there to be committed to something. And let's say, even as difficult as my relationship with Christianity institutionalized, um, white supremacy institutionalized, and like I said, that goes down into churches of color, like we got to root out the white supremacy and in institutions of color not because Christianity is white supremacist, because some Christian institutions are white supremacist. Well, what comes to my head? What song is coming into my head as I'm, as I'm basically being rooted out from my institution? I wake up with a song in my heart on the darkest day of my life. It's a Jesus song from the black church that I grew up in. So what is within comes out. And so I don't fight those things. I welcome them. It annoys me sometimes that a Bible verse comes to mind. I'm like, oh, blah, 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 whatever. But I'm like, just be where you are. That's the best thing that I've come to is not read another Christian book. Not, I haven't been reading the Bible. No, I haven't. It feels like a weapon. It's been used as a weapon against me. Okay. I don't feel guilt about not having a quiet time. I haven't had a conventional quiet time in 20 years. And that's probably the best thing I've ever done is throw off those conventions. Those don't make the church. Those don't make, and I mean, the small C Holy Catholic church, all of us, those don't make us. What makes us is living into the suffering of Jesus. And if you don't feel like you can call yourself a Christian, this model that I see of living the Sermon on the Mount is still something I think to be emulated. And so that's how I want to live as I work out my spirituality with fear and trembling. We are spiritual beings. The universe is one. The universe is one. Whether you believe in one God or many gods or no God, the universe is one. And we have to figure out what it means to be at one with the universe in a way that's holistic and inclusive of the dignity of every being, human, animal. Celestial, um, we are animals, but you know what I mean. So the earth, 
and we rape each other because we rape the earth. The earth is so connected to that vision. Um, and so I would just encourage y'all to stay on a spiritual journey and to seek that out. One thing that's been helpful to me is trying to read more in a mystical tradition that I didn't read before. And Catholics have done that much better than Protestants for a long time. And so I'm not reading quote unquote church fathers, but I am reading more into um, folks who write about them and or, you know, Richard Rohr being one. But I stumbled into that. It wasn't like a fad thing for me. And don't disavow that because you think it's a fad. So thinking about, um, and I haven't read his newest book, The Universal Christ, but um, I've heard him speak about the universal Christ. And that those were the things that I was trying to think into before I heard him label it as that. So feel free to explore and to have conversation. I think people are eager, whoever they are, to have spiritual conversation. So right. and that's the, the catalyst of why we do what we do here. So thank you so much for that and, and sharing, you know, and, and being vulnerable with, you know, kind of your journey with the film and then with us in this conversation. I mean, it's been, uh, it's been really great. Thank, thank you both. Um, I guess maybe just a, a closing question for both of you is now that the, the film is kind of finished and it's starting to, to roll out. How is, is that experience now on the other side of it, then reliving it and, and re talking about it? Um, how is that process for you? And then what are your hopes for the film? Like what, what do you hope that uh, the film accomplishes in the people and the hearts and the minds of the people that, that end up, um, end up watching it? You go first. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It'll be be briefer for you to say stuff. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, the film it's, it's, it's fascinating that when I started the film, I, thought that it would take less than a year to do. And then I thought it would be out. I actually was trying to get it out before the election in 2016, which is kind of adorable now to think about, you know, then we ended up filming for two and a half years. And part of that was because of financial delays. You know, I received grants and had to continually fundraise throughout the process, but I had this deep fear that the film was not going to be relevant anymore which also seems adorable, right? Because I was like, oh, this moment's going to be past us where (laughs) these issues (laughs) are so relevant, these issues of of race and Islamophobia and um, Donald Trump and all the other things that I explore in the film. So I guess from a filmmaker standpoint, it it was nice that the film was still relevant when it was finally released it's a sad commentary on our society that it actually feels more relevant now in 2020 than it did when I started filming in 2015. And again, that is something that, that has everything to do with the the power of art to capture a moment in time. And it's a moment in time that we're still very much experiencing. So all of those issues are, more salient now than they than they even were then if if you can believe it my hope is that people who watch the film um and i i think i'm even thinking specifically about your audience um a that they'll know that they're not alone that these issues of polarization and that sense of do we all worship the same god and I'm not talking about the Muslim Christian question with that. Again, I'm talking about, you know, Christians, people identify as Christian. Do we worship the same God? I mean, I think, you know, there's there's a lot of pain associated with that for many people. Uh, it's a painful question to ask. It's splitting families now. It splits friendships. You can't talk to people anymore. People that that faith used to be the common ground and now it's not common ground. And it's almost like you're speaking different languages. I hope that people watch the film and realize they're not alone and that it gives them some hope in terms of a vision for an alternative way to live out 
a spiritual life. I think Larisha has modeled that unintentionally, but she's modeled it beautifully. And I think her story is is inspirational in that it opens up possibilities for people, people that are burned out and dismayed and um, sick of the individualistic sort of capitalistic view of Jesus that maybe they uncritically embraced um, and grew up in and find themselves wondering, like, how do I hold on to things that are still meaningful to me, but try and find different language for it? I mean, the language of embodied solidarity, I personally find very helpful. I mean, it's a really helpful guiding point where it's like, okay, I, I may not know how I feel about all these other things. But I believe that and I and I believe I believe that it is the true and right way to live. There's truth there that is universal truth. And that's there's truth for me as somebody who identifies as somebody who tries to follow the teachings of Jesus. Um, But it's true in every religion. There's there's universal truth there. And that's really helpful so that you don't end up just adrift. Sorry, this is my own long answer, but you know, I was thinking, listening to your your question to Larisha about advice for people that find themselves in this sort of painful spot. Um, I mean, I I've started deconstructing in my well, I've I've never have had a comfortable relationship, honestly, with evangelicalism. I was raised very much in that tradition, but it was never comfortable. But I. I probably did what what would have been called deconstruction in my 20s, and that was a long time ago. Um, But I have a very clear memory of having told my parents I'm not going to church anymore, which was like announcing that I had AIDS or something. I mean, this was a big, terrible thing. And very defiantly, one Easter, staying home in my apartment in Atlanta, and it was the first Easter Sunday of my life that I hadn't been in church. And I ended up watching Jaws on TNM. And it was one of the most singularly depressing moments of my life because I, I watched Jaws and just sat there and thought, okay, next Easter, I'm going to go to church with somebody and then I'm going to eat some ham and have some rolls afterwards because that is a lot better than watching Jaws. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And so, um, and, but I, I share that story to say that that's, you know, be be mindful of what where, where are you headed, right? Because I don't, with all the pain and complication, you don't really want to end up watching Jaws on a day that has the potential to provide some hope for you, right? And to lift you up and so I don't watch Jaws. <laughs> so you, you may not have known that if you hadn't have done the Jaws exactly. day, yeah, right? Yeah. So you, yeah. you kind of do have to go through it, yeah? Absolutely. And, but be aware of it. You know, I think that that's, um, I'm glad that I had enough awareness to say, is this, is this better than what I'm doing? And the answer was no. So it's like, okay, how do I then take another step forward and find that, that place that's comfortable for me? So very long answer. I hope that that's one of the things that people, I I hope that people feel inspired to live their lives in a way that moves beyond these really harmful categorizations that I think so many of us have grown up with of what does it look like to, to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. I hope that this gives them something to hang on to. Um, so reliving the story has been difficult in lots of ways. I don't, we've lost track. I mean, at least I have. Maybe Linda has a tally of how many times I've seen the film again. Kind of like when we are doing a panel afterwards to stay in for a little bit and see people, like where the audience is. Are they super serious? Do they laugh when I say it's a metaphor? You know, that's sometimes people laugh, sometimes they don't. So that can be telling for us to know how to approach because it's a very heavy film. Um, When we were in New Orleans at the New Orleans Film Festival, I was sitting next to a woman who didn't know it was me. (laughs) And um, she was one of the sponsors of the film. She was with a film organization in New Orleans. 
one of the co-sponsors and she grabbed my, she was crying basically from almost from the very beginning of the film. And at some point she grabbed my hand. And then when I went up, she was like, I didn't know that was you. And so it's very difficult in part because I have post-traumatic stress syndrome and it's hard for me to have emotion about the film at all. Um, except when, you know, Michael Mangus's wife and Michael Mangus who stood in solidarity with me in his own way by showing some emails from the provost with uh, Time Magazine and didn't have his contract renewed um, because he was on a contract basis due to having had a stroke. When his wife talks about the sacrifice in their own body, that feels in their own family and in their own body, that feels really hard for me, but it's not an emotional thing. It, but it is, it's taxing in a way that I can't describe, except over time, the toll of watching it again and again, watching yourself go through that. And um, it's weird in the first place to see yourself like, yeah, that's me. Yeah, I probably gained 15 to 20 pounds through all of this because it was so traumatic. Um, to see those things is difficult. Um, but it also has been empowering because I had to accept myself and say, yeah, you went through hell and you gained weight and you'll be okay. And so it's been not healing in the way that I would say that people would think about healing, but it's been an opportunity to accept myself on this journey and to remember that I'm still on this journey. And it actually has been a way for my family to see what happened to me because my mom was in the middle of cancer. It was my mom who I was visiting in Houston. And so I didn't want my parents to be there for two months while I'm going through hell because my mom needed her help, right? She needed to be home, not with me in Chicago. That reliving has, it's just been mostly hard, but the good part is meeting people across the country who somehow are moved or angered, you know, moved in a positive way or angered, um, whether that's you're stupid and you don't know what you're talking about. You're creating controversy. You're stirring up shit, you know, whatever. I mean, it's all good. I mean, because it means the film is moving people to something, to some um, kind of decision point. But my, my major hope for the film is that it's an agent of change in that it moves people. I do believe, as I say in the film, that we are all on the front lines. I do believe we are in a time where there will be people who are martyrs for justice. And I'm not a negative person, but I think embodied solidarity is always to the death because that's what Jesus modeled. The cross is a bloody cross. And so evangelicals like to quote, carry your cross daily, and they put a little metal, you know, cross in their pocket. That's not what it means. It's a bloody cross. And I think that the stakes are higher than they've ever been in my life. I want people to be gripped by the seriousness of the moment that we're in. Um, I also want people to see the comedy. Life is tragic. It's comedic. It's prophetic. I'm a teacher. It's Socratic. Um, and I think the film does all of those things. And so I want it to be a vehicle for a movement for a moment, for education, for inspiration. Um, and again, that's the power of art. And I'm thankful for it as a vehicle, even though I think there's still part of me that doesn't know what to do with it. It's weird to be like to my students, yeah, there's this movie, you know, this documentary, I'm kind of in it, you know, I gotta go um, <laughs> off with the film for this Monday of class so we're not having class whatever and they get it they've already googled me so they already know so um because everybody googles their professors these days so they already know before I tell them but it's it's strange and at the same time this is how the universe is using you know what could have otherwise destroyed me but I won't let it so that's where we are um and it's good to be on the journey with someone and um, like Linda who get who gets wheaten and another thing is we wouldn't have done the film I wouldn't have the only one of the only things that helped me decide to do the film is that she was going to be fair to Wheaton College I want them to believe that the film is intended to trying to show 
my side of the story, yes. But I only did it because I knew Linda would try to pursue their side of the story, right? I always want to bless wheat in college and whatever I do. Yes, shake the dust off of my feet, but also bless them. Um, it's part of who I am. It's not my past. It's my present and it's my future. Not that I'm going back there. Um, I won't ever sign a litmus test again. But the reality is God bless Wheaton College because that's who I have to be to love my neighbor as myself. So that includes Wheaton and my colleagues whom I love dearly and my former students. And they're always part of my family. So. Well, thank you both so much uh, for coming on the show and sharing about the film and your journeys through it and uh, your journeys leading up to the film. Uh, we really appreciate it. So how, how can people find it? Where can we direct people towards uh, seeing this film and, and, and following both of your work going forward? Yes, I will answer that. Um, so we have a limited national theatrical release that is taking place on March 8th. There might be a few theatrical screenings that take place after that. I would recommend that people go to our website, which is samegodfilm.com. And we have a page there with all of the screenings listed. And so people can look and see if they have screenings coming in their area. Shortly after that, we will be released digitally, which I believe is going to be on iTunes. And um, I think we have a video on demand distributor that we're working on a deal with. And so really over the next couple of months, the film will be much more widely available to people than it has been. We've, we've had about a year and a half of it being only community screenings and we're moving past that. So I would, I would steer people to our website, samegodfilm.com and also follow us on social media because I try to really make announcements. And that is also it's same God film at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So we have lots of uh, updates on that. And then Larisha can fill you in on where to follow her. Yeah. Also, we'll be in 10 cities, three in California, where you guys are based, um, two at twice in LA, San Francisco, like Berkeley. I'll be in Houston on March 8th for the debut. We'll be in Detroit. What other cities am I missing, Linda? We've got um, Portland. We've got Portland, Seattle. Seattle. I think those are most of them. Yeah. And we might, I think Atlanta, we're doing Atlanta, but that might be March 15th. Yeah. ATL. So those are exciting. We also have some smaller screenings like universities. If y'all want to invite us out, documentary filmmakers, um, independent ones, especially don't make money. We, um, they make money. She's going to make money because we're going to have this big theatrical release and all of y'all are going to come. But I'm saying this to say we don't, we're not independently wealthy. If you want us to come be on a panel, we will. Um, but you got to pay to get us there. <laughs> um, cause we, cause it's not free and the screening rights are not free for a film. It's art. We got to support our artists like Linda. Also, for me, I am on the interwebs. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I've actually got two, Dr. Larisha Hawkins and Larisha Hawkins is my personal one. Um, also on Instagram and um, it's all at Larisha Hawkins. So my first name is spelled L-A-R-Y-C-I-A and last name H-A-W-K-I-N-S. So I'm the only Larisha Hawkins out there unless um, unless there's someone imposturing me. But find me. I'd love to hear from you and connect with you. And you can tell your local PBS providers if you want to see it on PBS. We've already had major distribution of the film on almost 80 percent of the country on um, pbs world channel but lobby your stations to show it again because some people have seen it that way as well so yeah yeah but if i could i really would encourage your viewers to if they manage to see the film to please share about it on social media because this is such a grassroots effort it's just we're a small film you know and so it actually really does make a difference if you tweet about us <laughs> or you put, put it, you share it with your friends on Facebook. It makes a world of difference. So um, if you see the film and it touches you and you're moved, please, please be vocal about that. We would really appreciate it. 
that is your way of being in embodied solidarity with us. You bet. There we go. Yep. Yes. <laughs> there we go. And and we will make sure to put all that information, all those links in our show notes. Uh, okay. So make sure that you check that out and you can, you can always find that at iranicast.com and we'll, we'll make sure that that is available as well. So, um, so yeah, thank you again for coming. Yes, We've, thank you I, I've really enjoyed this conversation and, uh, um, we're, we're excited that people are going to start seeing this film in, in, in bigger numbers and, uh, hopefully we can help spread the word with that. So thank, thank you again. Yeah. Both. Thank you for a good conversation. Yeah. Seriously.